Szanowni Państwo, niestety mój polski jest za słabo na mówić tę prezentację po polsku. Przepraszam bardzo. One day, one day I might get there, but it won't be today. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the external aortic root support project. Uh, this has been a very important part of my life for about the last 11 years. Um, I want to use it as an example to talk about um, multidisciplinary research and innovation. We enjoy a, a level of affluence and, and wealth in the developed West, and I certainly include Poland in all of that, which uh, is under threat. The emerging economies of China and India, where labor costs are incredibly low, are going to take all uh, manufacturing industry away from us, ultimately. They've already taken most of it. If we want to retain our standard of living, not necessarily our quality of life, but our standard of living, we desperately need to be doing something new which will allow us to compete with them. I think that multidisciplinary R&D uh, and the innovation that comes from it might be one of those things. As I say, I'm going to give you the external aortic root support as an example of this, uh, and then look at some of the problems and some of the advantages. I'm a process engineer. I know all about um, boilers and incinerators and fabric filters and cyclones and things like that. But I also have Marfan syndrome. This is an inherited disorder. And in 1992, I participated in a genetic study and found to my horror, as you can see from the slide, that my ascending aorta was not in the normal range, the green line at the bottom. Everyone in here will be between 3.2 three, to 3.6 centimeters. I was already up at 4.4. Four. And as you can see, it, my aorta dilated progressively, and I got closer and closer to the point where surgery was going to be necessary. The surgery on offer was pretty gruesome. Anesthetize you, open your chest, put you on an artificial heart and lung machine, drop your body temperature to about 18 centigrade, stop your heart, cut the aorta out, replace it with a plastic valve and a plastic aorta, and most importantly, commit you to a lifetime of anticoagulation therapy, normally warfarin. The thought of the surgery was not attractive. The thought of the warfarin was really quite frightening. So I said to myself, I'm an engineer, I'm in R&D, this is just a planning problem. I can do this, I can change this. So I set out to change the entire treatment for aortic dilation. The project aim is really quite simple. Um, the only real problem with, with the ascending aorta in people with Marfan syndrome is it lacks some tensile strength. So the possibility exists to simply externally wrap the pipe, and it would uh, remain stable and operate quite happily. If your high-pressure hose pipe or your high-pressure hydraulic line bulges a little, you just wrap some tape around the outside of it. It really is that simple in concept though not in execution. The great advantage of an external support for me was that I could retain all of my own bits, all of my own endothelium and valves, and not need any anticoagulation therapy. So where do we start? Well, this is a, a, a sagittal slice through me. You can see in the middle that uh, device, that little structure squeezing up. That's a left ventricle pu pushing blood up through the aortic valve. You can see two of the leaflets of the aortic valve working there, up into the ascending aorta. And it's that part, the ascending aorta, which uh, dilates and ultimately bursts, which of course is fatal. We started by organizing image acquisition from magnetic resonance image imaging machines and uh, CT imaging machines, uh, from which to make a model of the patient's aorta. This is a, a model of my aorta. Um, I've got a real one in my pocket, if anyone would like to look at it and play with it. Um, you can see it's quite a complex structure. It has a funny trilobal shape at the bottom, which contains the aortic valve. It then comes back into a round form and then tapers and curves off. So it's quite a difficult structure to, to produce. This, as I say, is a CAD model of me, and this, this is one of the later CAD models. We went through an iterative process of producing better and better models. When we produce that model, we turn it into a solid plastic model, as you can see, uh, using a, a rapid prototyping technique, another engineering technique. 
We then use that former to manufacture a perfectly bespoke porous textile mesh, which takes the shape of the former and perfectly fits the aorta. So this is absolutely personalized medicine at its best, really. Every patient we do has an absolutely bespoke in, uh, implant. Um, once you've made it, the installation is quite easy. Um, John Pepper, bless his heart, professor of cardiothoracic surgery, never done it before in his life. He put the first one in, didn't like it, took it out, put the second one in, happy, away I went. Four and a half hours on the table and everything was done. So the surgical implantation actually was the easiest part. If you compare our new treatment to the existing alternative, the so-called composite aortic root graft, there are one or two startling comparisons, which I'm sure will be clear to all of you. Um, two hours to install one of our devices compared to six hours for the, uh, the existing treatment. The existing treatment requires, as I've said, the heart-lung bypass machine, and it requires a total body cooling. We don't need any of that. We work on a beating heart. He opens you up. He accesses the aorta while your heart is beating, all at the right temperature, no breaking into your circulatory system. So it really is great. But for me, absolutely the best point is there is no anticoagulation therapy re required. I don't take any drugs at all other than recreational ones that I would choose to take. <laughs> um, and in fact, if you speak to people who are on long-term warfarin, it is a serious compromise to your quality of life, and even worse, it inevitably foreshortens your life. Likewise, if you have the artificial valve option, you're committed to antibiotic therapy whenever you have any intrusive medical treatment at all, even trips to the dentist require that you take antibiotics in case you get an internal infection on the valve. Again, I don't have any of that, so I'm entirely free. My aorta is fixed, and I haven't got to worry about it, which is a rebirth for me. Back to the theme of the uh, presentation and multidisciplinary research, how on earth does a process engineer used to working with boilers end up producing a medical device which transforms his own life? Well, the answer to that is a multidisciplinary team. This is a, a list of um, the, the core team, and as you can see, there are not only two principal uh, technical disciplines there, medicine and engineering, but also there are various specialists from within those two disciplines. Um, John Pepper there was the cardiac surgeon who did all the, the actual work on me, but everyone else there had to contribute one way or another. Um, Rab Mohyadin, medical radiologist, we had to get good quality images from which to make the CAD model. Uh, Warren Thornton, who still does all our CAD models for us, had to write a bespoke piece of CAD code to produce this model from this really rather difficult um, input data set. There are some barriers to this, though. There are some problems with it. Jargon is a big one. I would think no one in this room understands those four first jargon points there. The engineers amongst you will recognize rapid prototyping in CAD. The medics amongst you, if there are any, will, will recognize the first two. But there will be nobody else in this room that understands all of those four words. Taking the jargon out was very important to ensure that everyone in the team understood exactly what was meant when a particular phrase was used. Uh, disciplinary conventions were funny as well. We took a lot of horizontal slice images through me, uh, produced those slices, and then used those to build a, a CAD model. And the very first CAD model we made, the, the surgeons were playing with the plastic model and couldn't quite figure it out. And then we realized that it was actually a mirror image of the real aorta. And it was a mirror image because in the real world, we always look down on plans, plans of houses or streets or maps. In the medical world, they look up at plans. So the horizontal images were all an inversion. So one needs to be careful with disciplinary conventions. You, we, everyone needs to understand what is assumed and what is not assumed. Institutional barriers were another serious headache in the project. Uh, the Brompton Hospital was taken over by Imperial College at its School of uh, Medicine, and there is some seriously bad uh, relationship problems between the two organizations. I was working with Imperial and the Brompton, and this generated some serious problems with the project, Real, really problems that shouldn't exist. Research and Ethics Committee, if you want to do anything new in surgery, you have to get a license from your local research and ethics. I'm sure it's the same in Poland. There will be uh, uh, some form of equivalent which licenses new types of surgery. We didn't only have the bureaucratic problems associated with that, we also had professional jealousies. There were people on the Research and Ethics Committee who really didn't want to see John Pepper succeed again because he is so successful, and they made extra problems for us. 
bureaucratic problems. Um, ultimately, when you have a new, uh, a new treatment, you have to have a guidance note going out for all of the hospitals in the country. In the UK, we have the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE. You'll have an equivalent in Poland, no doubt. And we had to get past the, the, uh, the NICE problem. We, we now have a great clinical guidance out on the net. So any other hospital that's interested can come along, read the NICE uh, report, get in touch with us, and then get doing it themselves. Funding barriers, another big area to, to, be, to be concerned with. Um, a big problem with understanding one of those perspectives. When we first approached one of the big UK charitable organisations that funds this kind of stuff, what they were looking at was essentially an engineering proposal. They didn't understand it. They were doctors. They were next to God. It must be rubbish. They binned it. So in the end, I went out to private investors, and I just, get, just gave up on it. But, I mean, most R&D is going to be institutionally funded by the... Polish Academy of Sciences or the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council or whatever, and you need to get past those people. Jargon is a huge problem when you're trying to work across disciplines because, you know, in an engineering world, we all understand CAD and RP, not in the medical world. I suppose ultimately the funding bureaucrats have really got to get their act together. They've really got to start talking to each other and they've got to exercise a bit of imagination if that's not too much to ask, which it probably is. Um, <laughs> I've coined a phrase, obstructive conservatism. So many people in the medical world don't want to change, particularly not when some jumped-up engineer has come along with the answer. They don't want to change. They simply want to do whatever they've done before. And in fact, there are many surgeons in the UK still waiting for one of our patients to have, an, have some sort of episode so that they can say, ah, I told you that was no good. We've actually got 30 patients... I'm at seven and a half years, we've got 90 post-op patient years between us, and we haven't had a single problem, and still there are people in the UK saying, yeah, that external aortic root, yeah, it'll never work, you know. It really is a problem. It really is a problem. I'm sure everyone in this room has come across arrogance amongst me medics, doctors, surgeons at some point. The, uh, the, the middle point is simply the way, the, the, the way that the doctors protect themselves. Oh, well, of course, you know, I'm looking after my patient. I think it's... Not good, but there you are, that's my view. Egos, of course, he, again, a huge problem. If you're working in a multidisciplinary team, you've got to give your guys the benefit of the doubt, and you've got to express support for them. Tom Treasure, professor of cardiothoracic surgery, incredible guy, dead easy to give him respect. Him giving me respect, slightly different. That's all the bad news. The good news is the benefits are stonkingly huge. Translate that one, I bet they can't. Um, when you have a group of people who have had a different professional training, a different professional experience, they not only have a different knowledge base, but they have a different perspective on everything. And if you can bring those guys together and you can get them talking and understanding each other, the results can be spectacular. You can find novel solutions, really novel solutions that have never been looked at before, very, very quickly and easily. You can shortcut huge amounts of work simply by using the extended knowledge base you have. And as a result, it's a whole more, it's a, an entirely different use of the technology and the knowledge around you. Um, the, the result of all this is that you can get incredibly quick progress on incredibly small budgets. I'm so embarrassed at how cheap it was to get from my idea to me being implanted that I'm not prepared to tell you what it cost. Because I suspect there are absolutely standard surgical treatments, probably in the USA, which cost more for a one-off for a one-off uh, patient than the cost of us getting from my dream to my reality. Um, that's all I want to say, and I've got three minutes left, so Eva's going to like me. Um, if you have any questions, please come up and talk to me later on. It'll be a pleasure to speak with you. Many thanks. <laughs>